starting this weekend through the fall of this year. And so most of my energy is going to be in that. Uh, but I did a, about a week's worth of my own gigs uh, two, three weeks ago. And I will pepper some of those throughout the hot ride schedule as it becomes available and, and, uh, and doable. But 2016 represents a year to kind of figure out that right balance between the hot rise uh, dates, my own dates, um, some sessions here and there. Hopefully I can produce some records along the way and also do this, you know, teaching thing, which is uh, kind of a consistent energy. It's the closest thing I've ever had to a real job. So it's that, that kind of <laughs> defines the, the full balance of it all. Tell us more about the, the teaching, the Bluegrass School. Bluegrass Brian School. Sutton. Well, I'll try to put it succinctly here. There's a, it's an online guitar academy, and there's a lot of those out there. But what makes this different, if I could do my little sales pitch, so like Absolutely. <laughs> I've set you up. Thank you. T right there. <laughs> No, it's, uh, I, I, I uh, came across one of these things a few years ago and I thought if I ever had a chance to do this for Bluegrass, I would do it, but it's really neat. There's a curriculum that I've sort of written and, and developed for Bluegrass guitar based on the things that I think are important, like you mentioned earlier, right hand technique, delivering and tone consistently as you play, playing faster tempos musically, those kind of things, rhythm. And so, you know, it's sort of a system, it's kind of a, an approach to Bluegrass guitar, and then there's songs present in the curriculum and kind of use those, uh, use those, those that, that system and, that, and those kind of approaches. And so the, the guts of the site are um, a student will have access to the whole curriculum. They send me a video of them, of them working on whatever it is. If it's a turkey and a straw, if it's a cross picking pattern, if it's an exercise, a scale, whatever it may be, a rhythm, um, rhythm you know, interpretation, whatever it is, it's kind of wide open. And then I'll make a comment on it, and the whole student body, the whole, the whole community sees this video exchange process happen. So um, it's sort of like a virtual master class. Have you ever done master classes where there's a, an instructor and a student in front of the group learning? So the, the whole group learns while the, while the student learns. So that's, that's essentially what goes on. I really like doing that. That's wonderful. Um, tell us about some of your stylistic influences outside of the obvious bluegrass guitar players and whatnot. I mean, you have a wonderful little duet, trio really, but duet with, uh, with Bill Frizzell mm -hmm. on, on the new album, and that's a, a, a beautiful kind of musical match right. that you guys have. And so tell us about some of the other, whether it's jazz or in other, in other genres, yeah. people who've influenced you as a player, as a songwriter, composer. I listened to a lot of uh, blues and rock when I was a kid, a lot of heavy metal into guys like Eddie Van Halen and Paul Gilbert, uh, some of these sort of speed demon. I was never really into Ingve Malmsteen. It's, that was one step too far. Yeah, but Steve Vai, really, really dug into him. And uh, especially Van Halen. Van, Eddie Van Halen sort of, sort of just encapsulated this musicality, the, the precision, the power, and just really musical lines that he played. It wasn't all about the craft and the technique. Um, but his blend of, of music and mechanics. Uh, but yeah, a lot, of, a lot of heavy jazz players. I really spent a lot of years diving into Django Reinhardt because mm -hmm. I felt this sort of uh, synergy between the energy of gypsy music and the energy of bluegrass and, you know, rhythmically that... <laughs> Songwriting, you know, side of things. I've been around a lot of great songwriters here in Nashville. Uh, you know, Guy Clark, Tim O'Brien will always be one of my heroes in that world. <clears throat> and even, you know, folks down to uh, um, there's a guy in, in England, a Brendan Croker, who, uh, you know, it's interesting to hear somebody that didn't grow up in America to hear their version of country music and how they write and how they pick up on things and say, oh yeah. So it, for some reason, it seems it's, it's, that that's an interesting thing for me to dive into. So, and I'm really diving into a little more songwriters these days, guys like Jeffrey Folkhall and uh, folks like that. So, when you're writing, are you thinking about specific styles? You know, I want to need to do a bluegrassy kind of thing here, or I want to get away from a bluegrassy thing here. You know, it's weird because I'm sort of figuring that out. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I've never really done a whole lot of it, and. Uh, 
the curious thing is to try to allow what wants to come out to come out because sometimes some of the things I've written I'm like well, I, would, I would not really do that song but it sounds like something that somebody else might do I don't want to I don't want to limit it so much at this point um, there are things that I've written that I feel like that are things that I want to be doing I can sort of think that as it's developing like yeah this is this is something I can envision myself standing in front of people uh, playing and singing. Yeah. How much do you think about uh, specific musicians, other musicians? And Frizzell's Rag is maybe an obvious mm -hmm. case, but there are there other tunes where you're thinking, like, as you're crafting the composition, you know, I really should take it right. in this direction because Noam Pekelny is just going to mm -hmm. just going to thrive if I do. Yeah, I do that. You know, it's uh, when I or when I produce something, or when, if I've written something and think about a recording of that, I will hear a certain sound of a certain musician. Um, yeah, as part of the production process, but that, that waltz that I played earlier, Overton Waltz, the reason it's called that is because uh, Bela Fleck wrote a song called Overgrown Waltz, and Bela Fleck lives on a road in Nashville, that part of the name is Overton, and so that's a little bit of an homage to him. My song is a... And his over, Overgrown Waltz is... things up to let members of the audience ask you questions if they have them. Um, maybe play us one more tune and then we'll spend a few minutes okay. with the audience. <coughs> um, I'll try to croak through another original here. <laughs> this is one of the, I, for some reason I'm thinking to do this, this is the most recent thing I've written here. And it's all about uh, kind of getting out of town, going to the mountains. How many of you guys ever just like the thought of getting up into the mountains and the trees and going, you know, either uh, rafting or just camping up in the mountains? That's, you know, there's two things that I do throughout the year. One is go back to see family in North Carolina. When you start leaving Knoxville and you kind of see the hill show up there in front of you, there's that. And there's also going to Telluride, Colorado every year for the festival there. And so it hit me in Telluride this past year that, uh, these weren't, I wasn't just heading for the hills, but these were, these were hills for the head, so that's what this song is all about. <clears throat> Traveling east on 40, I got the girls and a herring bone, and when I see that bridge come into view, I know I'm on where old time friends and family welcome in their native son. They remind me of where I've been and point me where I've yet to run. With ocean for my soul, ground for my bed, I need a home for the heart, I need hills for my head. Kind of listen 
And I don't mean to be rude But if you don't mind I'll take my time and go gain some altitude With an ocean for my soul ground for my bed I need a home for the heart I need hills for my head Sutton makes mistakes hey. <laughs> every day. So, do any of you have questions for Brian or things you'd like to share? Yes, sir. Hey, how you doing, Brian? Hey. Thanks for coming. Um, what are some of your biggest challenges you find in practicing to become such an accomplished musician? Uh, the challenges in practice have, especially for me in the last 15 to 20 years, is finding good time, making good time. Um, Oftentimes, I feel like I'm doing some of my best practice in the middle of the show, <laughs> which, you know, there's, there's merit to that as well as far as, like, going from just a practicing musician to going to, to a performing musician. It's sort of like a whole different environment, and so, you know, I have gleaned a lot out of that. Like, can I do this in performance? And sometimes, like that right there, just writing a song and thinking, can I get through all that and remember all the words? Sometimes yes, sometimes no, but you learn from whatever happens and you move on. So that's, you know, that's, that's a learning, uh, learning opportunity, um, learning to perform with allergies and, you know, when the sound's not great, you know. So certain, I feel like to, trying to answer your question of, of the, the best practice that I've gotten over the last, you know, especially the 15 to 20 years have been on stage, but yet it's meant something. It's not been just because it's the only time I've got the guitar in my hand, but it's it's allowed me to kind of hone real time what's going on. Um, I've done a little bit better job over the last several you know months even to to a couple of years. And part of it is that sort of evolving energy of wanting to do more music of my own and and, and create more time to write, create more time to to work on something, to kind of see something through. Um, you know, oftentimes in, in practice, if I just feel limited, um, I don't give myself the time to just sort of break something apart and leave it on the workshop bench and come back to it, you know, like a puzzle or something. So just having that, a lot of those, a lot of the written instrumental tunes from this most recent record were written that way, where it was just, they kind of existed in parts that kind of, maybe this is good, maybe I'll remove this, or I still feel like it needs another part, and what is that? So it's kind of an ongoing thing in my head, too. Do you have a practice routine? If you have some good chunk of time at home to practice, do you have a, a specific routine that you go through? It's again sort of evolving, and it sort of depends on what the need is. If there, you know, there have been moments in my career where, like, uh, there was I did this big project with Mark O'Connor, Chris Thiele, and Byron House, where there was a lot of music to learn over a few months, and so like, every available minute was looking, excuse me, looking through this manuscript of all the guitar parts. And that was the need at that time. Right now, what, I, what I'm finding when I have the time, it's, uh, it's working on um, absorbing more of what I'm writing. A lot of times when I, when I finish writing a song, it happens pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And so I really like having the time to just sit in my studio. Sometimes I'll sit in front of mics and record it, just to kind of let it, let it sit within me a little bit. you know. Mm -hmm. Or uh, just giving things, like I said earlier, giving things time to mature is a good, is a good use of my time these days. Yes. Other questions? In a genre like bluegrass, with where technicality is such a big factor, like with timing and mm -hmm. all the running 16 notes, <laughs> um, I'm sure that natural talent isn't something that can get you very far. But as a child, did you find that pitch and rhythm and things that, like that came naturally to you, or did you really, you know, have to work at it? Um, that's a good question. Or was it just being surrounded by like, your family and always having that background? Really yeah, it's probably a blend of all that, but I would say, you know, especially after kind of working with a lot of uh, guitar players now over the last two or three years, my advantage of starting as a kid and the technical side you're talking about with bluegrass and the speed and, and, and getting the notes, a lot of notes quickly, uh, the reason I can do that now is because I did a lot of work as a kid that didn't seem like work, it was just fun, and then also sort of physically grew up around the guitar. Uh, I mean, I remember coming uh, home late at night, going to sleep, waking up, and my hand still basically being in this position, holding the pick, 
my my left hand is bigger than my right hand. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's uh, so I sort of yeah, grown up grown up with the guitar and around the guitar, and that that fed into that. But um, the things that I, I noticed that there were changes that I made the Skag thing, like I mentioned earlier, where I had to sort of relearn some things and and kind of uh, get back in shape. That was an opportunity for me to take some of the natural stuff that happened when I was a kid and really sort of turn it into more of, okay, this is pro level stuff here. This is this is not a game or anymore. This is this is time to you know to put up or shut up. And it kind of felt like that to me. And I, and I learned a little more about relaxing, a little more about uh, how to play consistently, how to avoid tension. Those those kind of things that uh, are really important when playing bluegrass guitar. Um, so I went through sort of the evolution there too. Uh, but always, you know, I feel like maybe I'm getting away from your question, but uh, um, it did come naturally, but it's gotten better over the years and continues to get better. There are certain aspects of a lot of the more cerebral side and the thinking and the, um, you know, the intuitive thing that sometimes I, in the effort to try to make something a certain way or too mechanical and less musical, I'm trying to be a little more musical these days. And it's a lot of times trusting that the mechanics are going to be there. And that's, that's sometimes a challenge. But with the students you work with through the Bluegrass School, you mentioned earlier you've got specific exercises, cross-picking exercises. Yeah. There's some things that if you're going to improve, you need to work on them mechanically. Right. Yeah, the Bluegrass guitar is all about this, to me, at it, it, its root, is this blend of mechanics and, and music. Um, because there's, it's not just playing all the right notes, but there's a certain level of quality that, that we assign to these notes. We're talking about pitch. There's a certain way to do bluegrass, and, there's a, there's, and that's the craft of it. Um, and I honor that, and I, and, I, and I love that. I love how that can inform other things that I try to do, uh, like that waltz piece that I played earlier, um, or you know, the other, you know, like the thing with Bill Frizzell, things like that. But uh, yeah, this, it, when it comes down to it, it's you know, the, the right hand technique is is a pretty unique thing there, and um, you know, playing this kind of guitar. And I enjoy sort of digging that, digging into that. I've had, you know, a lot of what I talk about on the site is from years and years and years of discussions with people like uh, Chris Thiele and, and Chris Eldridge and Julian Lodge and, and uh, Tony Rice even. And sort of, you know, getting inside the machine that is bluegrass guitar picking. Do you have a question? <clears throat> when doing your session work, have you ever encountered or witnessed any kind of scenario where um, someone's ability to, to read music and maybe in a, in a really timely manner has ever um, crippled their career as a session player or resulted in them not being called back? And also, would, would you... What because would you they say, can read so well? Right. Okay. Or, and would you say, what would you say is more valuable um, for a session player to have uh, extensive theoretical knowledge or a good ear? Uh, I think ultimately it's both. It also depends on what you're trying to do. You know, for me, moving to Nashville, knowing that I'm pretty much going to play country music and bluegrass, um, and understanding that number charts are about as complicated as it's going to get, um, it's more about the ear. It's more about listening and knowing how to improvise and 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 do what you know. If, if the fiddle player has a lick that I want to twin, play at the same time, then I can pick up that quick with that kind of stuff. Uh, but as far as the reading. In, in a town like Nashville, oftentimes that means that your group of people that you work with and work for are a different group of people. Maybe you're doing more jingles, or maybe you're doing more soundtrack kind of things, or big corporate music kind of things. Uh, as far as the business of recording music in Nashville, there, there are different camps set up. I don't know what you play, but uh, like for uh, string players, for instance, um, you know, there's people. Uh, people here that work all the time, reading every day. And so their reading skill is honed. They're jazz guitar players that, that read every day. It may not be, you know, uh, a jazz tune or anything like that, but it's but it's some something that somebody's written from a more, uh, you know, specific standpoint of we got to have this, this right note right here, right now. And so, you know, I mean, I, I would be at a, uh, a disadvantage in that session. So it, it depends on where you want to go with it. Right. But ultimately, I know, I'm thinking of players, there's one guy that comes to mind right now, Jeff Taylor, that plays uh, accordion and piano with the time jumpers. And he's one of the best at both. He, he can listen and he can, and he can blow and, and, and solo the best of them, but he can also read 
uh, one thing we put in front of them as well. Well, we're almost out of time, so can we bother you for one more tune? Sure. Before we have to say goodbye. Gosh, I'm out of my repertoire. All four songs. Here's a song about Nashville. And uh, something you said earlier. Oh, looking at that picture of Dave Macon. It started in 1926, actually. But um, the Cumberland River on Christmas Day in 1926 was three miles wide, according to the news reports. And there was a tune called the Backwater Blues that was written out of this that Bessie Smith recorded from Chattanooga that a lot of people have covered. This is Dave Macon's version that uh, I think it only exists in the transcript from the offering with the three-yard drinkers. But uh, anyway, it's Dave Macon's backyard, uh, backyard. Backwater Blues that nobody's covered. So now, Backwater's up, the folks are running. We're going up a mountain, and we're going down. The Cumberland River sure is a running very well. Oh, little darling, ain't I going?